parchment then. Oh, yeah, me and Jamie <laughs> do a presentation for us yesterday. This is the second time doing this. Uh, no. Actually, he never does the same presentation twice. No. I really don't know what he's going to be presenting. The one that we had seen last night with the parents was absolutely amazing and a little scary at the same time. And I'm assuming that this will probably be along the same lines. He's done a lot of work with getting students and teachers and, and parents, really, to, to think forward as to what to expect as we move forward. We, we talk about 21st century skills, and he's talked about really there are going to be more common sense type of skills that are going to allow us to focus on process rather than product. So without saying too much more. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for showing up, folks. And, and I want you to know, if any of you have to deal with this guy over here, you know, you have my deepest sympathies. You understand that the counseling can be provided to you. Now, now, some of you being uh, at some of my sessions that I've done over the course this week, background, real quick, classroom teacher every grade from kindergarten through to grade 12, six months teaching kindergarten, seven years of rehab after the fact, okay? And if you've ever worked with really young kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. School vice principal, school principal, district coordinator for gifted and talented technology and curriculum. I'm from British Columbia, provincial coordinator for uh, British Columbia for distance learning and technology, a university professor for seven years at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and the author of 14 books, I got three more books in the can right now, seven educational series. Uh, I travel a lot you know, over the course of the last, I don't know, say five years. I've done 50 US states, I've done nine provinces. Nepal next week is going to be my 80th country. I, I typically travel about 200 days a year, and I typically speak to three to 400,000 people a year. And I want you to know that even though I get to travel all over the planet, as I was explaining to some people this morning, it's far from a romantic or a glamorous life. This is my usual view of the world. Now, in my travels, I've worked for the World Bank, I've worked for the U.S. Federal Reserve, I've worked for people like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. I've worked for communities that have lost their economic momentum. I've worked with architects who are designing new learning environments for the 21st century. I am literally all over the place. And I come to places like this right here to do this. What I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to stand up, I'm supposed to talk to groups of people like you about the changing world we live in and what it means for us and what it means for our students. Because truly, passionately, what I've been put on this earth to do is to change what happens here. So that it looks a little less like this and a little more like this. And, and if I can do that, you know, maybe I can prevent this from happening. Okay? And if I can change what happens here, I can change what goes on here, and here, and here, and here, and God forbid, maybe even here. And you see, if we change what goes on here, we can change what goes on here. So what I want to do is I want to talk about change. But before, before I start talking about change, what I want you to know is when I stand up in front of an audience like you, I know that I face a great challenge because, you see, as I look around this room, what I know intuitively, what I know unconsciously is that I'm pretty much looking at a group of people who've spent their entire lives since they were six years old in school. Is that true for some of you? Yeah. See, for most people in this room, for most people in education, we have sat for the longest time in what I like to call the edge-centric box. We've had very little opportunity, very little need to understand things that are happening outside of education that hold, hold profound implications for those of us inside of education. And you see, if you've spent most of your life inside the educentric box, it's absolutely certain that you, like me, suffer from a terrible affliction. It's called terminal PP. And terminal PP is not a bladder issue. You understand? Your terminal PP stands for, this is a jargon word, Stands for terminal paradigm paralysis. And folks, a paradigm is not two dimes. You understand? It's not 20 cents. A paradigm is your mindset. A paradigm is your perspective. A paradigm is a filter through which you look for significance in the world. And the thing is that a paradigm can be incredibly powerful and that it can prevent you from seeing things from other points of view. Let me give you an example of a paradigm that each and every one of us in this room has this very early on in our life that significantly impacts the way we view the world today. Would you take your hands like this, please? Come on, the secondary people can do this too. Let's go, okay? Now when I say go, what I want you to do is very 
quickly without thinking about it. I want you to put your hands together, cross your fingers, cross your thumbs. No, before, come on, up, slower, you're okay. Ready, set, go. Okay, now look down at your hands. Now, how many of you are left thumb over right thumb? And how many of you are right thumb over left thumb? Now, is there anyone else out there that is like confused and needs some remediation on this? Now, pull your hands apart. At this time, when I say go, well, not before, what I want you to do is very quickly without thinking about it, I want you to put your hands, not just your thumbs, I want you to put your hands back together the opposite way, and despite the urge you will have immediately to pull your hands apart, I want you to keep them together the opposite way. Ready? Set? Go. Now, do you notice something right away? It just doesn't feel right. This is what it feels like when we are confronted by change. It makes us feel uncomfortable. Cross your arms like this. Now try to cross them the other way. Oh, lady, you need help. You need help. Now, the interesting thing is that for 85% of the population, how you cross your hands, how you cross your arms, how you cross your legs, that's actually embedded into your genetic code. In other words, you're born with it. But about 15%, that's typically in place by the time you're about 18 months old. And something as simple as that can demonstrate how powerful a paradigm, a mindset, a worldview can be in preventing you from seeing things from other point of view. But what I want to do is I want to use that demonstration to talk to you about the challenge of change. Over 90 years ago, then U.S. President Woodrow Wilson wrote that it's easier to move a cemetery than it is to change a school, even though they are similar activities, right? And, and very much the same vein, Lou Ritz also recently commented that it's easier to change the course of history than it is to change a history course. So like I said, I want to talk to you about change and what it means for you personally and professionally. I want to talk about change, what it means for you and for your families. I want to talk about change and what it means for you and your students. I want to talk about change and what it means for you and your communities. I want to talk about change and what it means for you and the rest of the world. I want to talk about change and what it means for the future of education. The bottom line is that we face a world that is constantly on the move. We face a world where change has become so accelerated that we only really begin to see the present when it's already disappearing into our past. And that's because, very simply put, today we live in exponential times. The problem is that most people, quite simply, do not understand what living in exponential times really means. Living in exponential times means we're dealing with change that is literally beyond our ability to comprehend. I, I saw a commercial recently, let's see if the video works in this, I saw a commercial recently that perfectly summarized this nicely. Here we go. It is the newest, even newer. Oh, everything else is obsolete. I just bought this one. Oh, oh wait. Oh, 4D TV. I'm glad I finally have on this presentation. The problem is that so many of us are so mired in our struggles with existence of everyday life, so mired to the tyranny of the urgent, that, that it's really hard for us to step back and visualize what exponential change really means. It's really hard to visualize the power of exponentialism. It's really hard to visualize the exponential future, because no matter no matter how we try, unconsciously, we slip back into our paradigm. We slip back into our comfort zone. We slip back into our mindset. We slip back to thinking about the future linearly. A writer, inventor, futurist, Ray Kurzweil, explains exponential this way. He says, with 30 linear steps, you get to 30. He says, with 30 exponential steps, you get to 1 billion. Exponential change leads to disruptive times. We're talking about times that, that warp social lives, that transform intellectual horizons, that upend long-standing social traditions and cultural traditions, and mess with just about every aspect of our lives, the way we work, the way we play, the way we communicate, the way we view our fellow citizens, in particular, as I'm going to point out in a few minutes, the way we learn. 
Recently with a couple of friends, I wrote this book called Living on the Future Edge. And basically, what we say is that there are a lot of global exponential trends out there, but the real driving force for change in our lives today is the result of something called Moore's Law, which is named after this guy right here. This guy right here is Gordon Moore, who was the co-founder and the first chairman of the Intel Corporation. The Intel Corporation today produces about 75% of the microchips you find in devices around the world. Way back in 1963, four years before he co-founded Intel, he wrote an article in something called Electronics Magazine, in which he referred for the very first time to Moore's Law. And in that article, what he predicted was that based on the state of chip technology design at that time, back in 1963, what he predicted was that the technological processing power and speed of any electronic combination device was going to double every 24 months, while during the same period of time, the cost to produce that technology was going to decline by 50%. Let me translate what I was saying there. What he was predicting was that you were going to get twice the power at half the price every two years. And the amazing thing is, but that prediction has remained amazingly on the mark for almost 50 years. Now let me try to put this into perspective for you really quickly. In 1978, using a computer meant operating a microcomputer with an awesome 8K of RAM on board. You understand? And remember that it takes 1,024K of RAM to make up one megabyte. And back then, back in 1978, you could buy a computer with 8K of RAM, quite inexpensively, it wouldn't cost you more than 250 to 350,000 US dollars. The next year, one year later, in 1979, personal computers suddenly burst onto the scene and almost overnight, sales went through the roof. So one year later, in 1979, if you were thinking about buying a computer, the big decision you were gonna have to make was, are you gonna have 8K of RAM on board, or are you going to go all out and sell the farm so you could have 16K of RAM? Understanding that back then, 16K of RAM was a heck of a lot of RAM. It was nice to know you had more than enough if you ever needed it. Back then, you couldn't have a hard drive because they weren't commercially available. Instead, what you got was, anybody remember this? A five and a quarter inch floppy disk that held 128K of information. 128K of information was 40 pages of single space typewritten text. Fonts, forget about it. Graphics, ain't thanks for playing circle web, no way, Jose. The speed of this thing was a remarkable two megahertz. Now let me translate that in non-technical terms. Two megahertz meant that this device was slow. So slow, you could turn on your computer, start the software, go out and renegotiate the mortgage on your house, re-roof, re-side your house, and if there wasn't an input-output error, maybe the thing was up and running by the time you got back. The interesting thing is that one year before, that same system would have cost you between two hundred and fifty and three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So a price of five thousand dollars U.S. dollars, okay, or ten zillion, whatever they are here, was quite a bargain. Let's fast forward to eighty-four. Eighty-four is the year that the Mac is introduced. Now the Mac really wasn't that much more powerful than any other computers in 1979. But the point we have to make here is you can't be fooled because the development of personal computers was following an exponential rather than a linear growth pattern. So, so most computers at that time had 128K of RAM. The disk drive capacity had tripled from 128K to 400K. The processing speed had quintupled from a smoke of 2 megahertz to a flaming 10 megahertz. And even though net internationally at that time we were dealing with 15% inflation, the cost of this technology had dropped from $5,000 less than $3,900. Now, in late 84, Gordon Moore writes another article in which he, for the first of many times, revises Moore's Law. And he basically said, oh my God, he said, the chip technology design is improving so rapidly that what you need to understand is that the technology is no longer doubling in power every 24 months, it's now doubling in power every 18 months. Now, I could go on and on, I usually do. And there's been a lot of changes between 1984 and today because a lot has happened, but I don't really have much time right here, so I'm going to cut to the chase. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to 2013, but the very first thing I do before you show you the table for 2013 is I have to apologize for that table because it's completely out of date. You understand? I haven't updated that table in like two weeks. You understand? Okay? So if you buy a computer with four gigabytes of RAM, you're probably not going to regret the decision for at least another couple of weeks, right? And if you don't have a 750 gigabyte hard drive, where in the world are you going to store all that music and video being 
downloading from the web. And if that thing doesn't have at least four and a half gigahertz of throughput speed, you're going off on the twilight zone waiting for that device to start. But the interesting thing is that today in North America, the majority of desktop and laptop and tablet technologies start under $350. And you get this, a full 30% of them started under $200. Okay? But here's the point. See, if you understand that we are living in exponential times, what you need to appreciate is that you can't just assume that tomorrow is going to be a linear extension from today, okay? But rather, we need to see what's happening today as part of an exponential continuum from where it's come from to where it is to where it's going to go. And the question is, if that's where we are in 2013, what does the future hold? Well, who better to ask than Gordon Moore, now retired, living in the south of France, who's estimated to be the 12th wealthiest man on the planet, who regularly gets asked the very same question that he's been asked for 40 years. What is the future of Moore's law? And I have to tell you this, what he predicts continues to blow my so-called mind because what he says is that just based on the current state of technology design today, he says this exponential doubling of Moore's law, remember exponential, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, he says that exponential doubling is going to continue for at least another 15 to 20 years, and I will tell you this categorically, the recent announcements made simultaneously by research scientists from IBM and Hewlett Packard in the area of molecular electronics lead many experts in the field to project that this exponential doubling of Moore's law is not going to continue for another 15 to 20 years, it will probably continue for at least another 50 to 100 years. And the point here is, when you extrapolate out, the future is just unbelievable and unimaginable. And you know, honestly, I'm not really concerned about you and me. I'm not really concerned about our readiness for that future. I'm more concerned about the next generation. I'm more concerned about the children that entered kindergarten in your school last fall. The kids that are going to be part of the graduating class of the year 2026. The schools as we know them still exist at that time. And my question is, just based on a recent extrapolation of Moore's Law, what kind of technology is going to be common to them? What kind of technology is going to be common to us? One generation of students up, and I ask you this, how many of you would like to have a machine with 200 terabytes, 200,000 gigabytes of RAM? How many of you would like to have a 40 terabyte hard drive, which by the way, was released three years ago by IBM, is the size of a Rubik's Cube, and stores all that information in holograms. How many of you would notice if your machine was moving along at 1.2 million megahertz. And this is the audience participation part. You understand that ESP won't do here. How many of you would be willing to spend $1.37 for such a device? Hands up. And how many of you, on the other hand, think it is so pathetic that I have to bring my drinking problem up in public like this? How many of you look at that table and don't believe me? Here's the problem. I look at that table and I don't believe you. But then I think all the way back to 1979, and I compare those numbers to today. Now let me try to put things into perspective. This is the ENIAC computer. This is the world's first digital computer. It was turned on for the first time on Valentine's Day, 1946, at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Now understand that the ENIAC computer was a building-based computer. It was the size of a building. It had two floors. One floor just for the computer, one floor just for the computing system. Okay? This thing weighed 30 tons. The portable version was 7 tons. It was 8 feet high. It was 100 feet long. It cost $750,000 in 1946. It was like $10 trillion a day. This thing consumed so much electricity. When they turned this thing on, the lights of Philadelphia dimmed. And at the center of the ENIAC computer were more than 17,000 vacuum tubes that emitted so much light that inevitably the ENIAC computer attracted moths. And that's where the term computer bug came from. Because the moths would fly around, they get fried in the tubes, they get zapped in the wiring, and the first technicians back in 1946 had to positively prove that they had solved the computer glitch by handing in a bug report, literally taping the offending bug to their log books besides the entry describing the problem. Now understand this, 
The AMIAC computer typically lasts about seven minutes until you break out, sort of like the computers you're dealing with in your lives right now. But the people at the time just couldn't believe what this thing could do, because this thing could multiply a 10-digit number by another 10-digit number in three one-thousandths of a second, even though by our standards today, in 2013, that device was clunky and hokey and unreliable. It was a gigantic leap forward in computational power. Who could have imagined that within a few generations, that this device is going to lead to your iPhone, it's going to lead to Wii's, it's going to lead to iPads, it's going to lead to all those other digital wonders. Now, now why am I telling you about a device that is more than 75 years old? I'll tell you why, because of this right here. This is a microprocessor that is so small that you could accidentally inhale and swallow it and not even realize you've done that. And yet that chip there, I want you to focus your eyes on that chip. I want you to focus right on that chip. That chip right there is more than a million times cheaper, about 100,000 times smaller, and more than 20 million times more powerful than the building-based UNIAC computer from 1946. And that's just now. Remember, we live in exponential times. So the question, the question I ask is, that's what we've got now. What, what do you think the exponential future is going to look like 10 years up? Because I don't know about you, but I can't even begin to imagine this stuff. But I'll tell you what I do understand. One decade up, all of us, not just us, but our kids, we're all going to be looking at technologies that will be measured in terms of billions, if not trillions of times more powerful than the technologies we commonly use today. And you see, that's not a problem for kids, that's a problem for us. In fact, it's a serious problem because most people in this room can remember a time when this stuff didn't exist. You see, throughout our lives, change has been relatively gradual, it's been relatively predictable. It's only been in the last 10 years or so that we've really started to feel the momentum of exponential growth. You see, as I speak at this moment, these exponential trends continue to grow exponentially as a result of that. I'm going to predict that we are going to continue to experience powerful, disruptive innovation at an unprecedented and extreme rate. We can't continue to deny that that is happening and that it's going to continue to happen. So what's the point of what I'm saying here? The real point of this all is, and the real challenge we, all the people in this room, face, both personally and professionally, is that while we can remember a time when these powerful technologies didn't exist, for our students, for the digital generation who were born into the new digital landscape, you understand there has never been a time where these powerful technologies haven't existed. And because of exponentialism, things have not only changed, but they're going to continue to change exponentially. Now let, let me show you what I mean. What I want to do is I want to show you some devices that already exist. You may not be able to buy them, but they already exist. That will give you an idea of what our future might look like. Let's start with display technology. This is Microsoft's skin put. This device can use our skin to display menu choices, okay? It turns our hand into a number pad or a screen or buttons so literally you can dial your cell phone from cell phone from your hand. Or what about this right here? This is Sony's bendable electronic paper. I want you to think etchel sketch right here. You fill the screen, you read the information, you shape it, and then you refill it. Or what about this? This is a Samsung device that you can roll up and you can wear as a wristband. Or look at the smartphone right here that it's as so thin and portable as a credit card, or, or this right here. What do you think this is right here? I'll tell you what this is. This is a Bluetooth headset. It uses bone conductive technology, so you can talk into your earphone while still hearing all the ambient noises around you, okay? And when you're not using it, it folds up and you wear it like a ring. And on the outside of it, it has an LED display that shows caller ID, text messages, and other alerts. And yes, ladies, I know you're thinking this, it comes in a blinged out version with your choice of gemstones, you understand? Or what about this right here? This is a Mercedes-Benz SCL 600 to them. This is a prototype technology. This is a concept car that most people in this room, if not all the people in this room, are probably too old to drive. And I'm not kidding when I say that. Take a look at this thing right here. Look at the gold wings. 
Look at the high tech trunk. But so far, it doesn't seem like that. Different, does it? Okay? Let's take a look inside. Ah! There's no steering wheel. The, there, there's, no, there's no brakes either. There's no pedals. You drive and you brake. Hopefully, that's B R A K E with a joystick. Now, here's my question. Can you drive a car with a joystick? Because I know some of you can. Your kids. And here's the scary thought. Your seven-year-old steals your car. And they probably drive it better than you can. Okay? Unfortunately, because they've been playing Grand Theft Auto, they have this overwhelming desire to rob a convenience store and maybe run over a couple of bag ladies in the process, right? Do you remember a few years ago when we started to see people wearing these things right here? Bluetooth headset, right. I remember seeing them and thinking, oh man, the nerds have inherited the earth. But you know, over time, I admit, I got comfortable with them and I actually started using one. But now, you see, that's ancient history. Because we got this thing right here. This is Google Glass. This is an augmented reality headset. What do I mean by that? It augments our memory, it augments our vision. This device right here, Includes a camera, a microphone, a wireless internet connection, a heads-up display, a touchpad, and what you can do is you can use it to record and replay any moment in your day, or to immediately search for any single discrete piece of information you want. Right now, right now, the test version on this costs about fifteen hundred dollars. Within two years from now, it'll be on the clearance table at Walmart for a dollar thirty-seven. Now let's take a look at what it does. Okay, let's record a video. Videos in the eye, okay? 
And the prediction is within three years, this kind of technology will begin to eliminate the need for monitors and it will be used to project any kind of information in any format, whether it's a video or weather or stocks or websites or news, blood sugar. I mean, listen, literally, it's your imagination. This, this is augmented reality. This is where a layer of virtual information is put on top of reality. What I'm about to show you is a $1.99 piece of software called WordLens. You try to figure out how they use augmented reality. Video, any painting, any TV or radio program, web page, blog post, music, the entire works of humankind from the beginning of recorded history in all languages accessible anywhere on the planet wirelessly within a fraction of a second because that is exactly where these new technologies are going to take us in the next 10 years. How, how will these developments, how will these technologies change our lives? How will they change the way we work? How will they change the way we play? How will they change the way we communicate? How will they change the way we learn? How will they change the skills and knowledge and habits of mind that students are going to need to be able to operate in this new digital landscape? Now you think about this in context. 70 years ago, a computer was the size of a building. Today, the computer in your pocket, otherwise known as your smartphone, is more than a million times cheaper, more than 10 million times more powerful, and about 100,000 times smaller than that device. And what you understand is, when we consider these devices, we have to acknowledge that we live in exponential times. And we need to understand that in the next couple of years, the next three, four years, what used to fit in the building, and now fits in your pocket, is soon...